All right, good morning, everyone. I think it's time to get started. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's Region 4 Project ECHO session from the Emory University School of Medicine Serious Communicable Diseases Program, run in conjunction with the Southern Regional Disaster Response System and the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. My name is Gavin Harris, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we begin, please know that we will be recording this session and your data while used for informative purposes will be kept confidential. For those unfamiliar, ECHO is an acronym standing for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes founded by the University of New Mexico. It's designed to disseminate and amplify best practices in a collaborative and interactive manner. And if you are interested in participating in future sessions, please reach out to us. Details will be at the end and on our website. If there are any issues during the webinar, please send us an email or type in the chat. And if you would like to ask a question during the session, please type it into the Q&A feature. We will do our best to answer questions in real time and we'll discuss as many questions live as we are able. If we do not get to all questions, we will post a recap addressing those topics on our website when the recording for this session is available as a podcast next week. These sessions are accredited for continuing education credits by the AMA and the ANCC. Credit can be obtained for attendance upon completion of a survey at the end of the session. The presenters and the planners of this session have no financial conflict of interest with ineligible companies to disclose. And here's today's agenda. The session will focus on the current state of and best practices for influenza A, H5N1, and will be preceded by our Region 4 Special Pathogens of Concern Situation Report. Following that didactic presentation, we will also have a public health presentation from Region 4 in Georgia. And after all the presentations, we will have time for moderated open discussion. So now it's my honor to introduce our guests for today. And first, I would like to introduce Dr. Ann Piantadosi, Assistant Professor of Medicine here at Emory and duly appointed in the Departments of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine and the Department of Medicine Division of Infectious Diseases. Dr. Piantadosi's laboratory studies emerging infectious diseases and bio threats with public health implications using translational, bench, and innovative computational approaches. Next, I'd like to welcome back Dr. Tim Uyeki, Chief Medical Officer for the Influenza Division at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in Atlanta. Dr. Uyeki has worked at CDC on the clinical aspects, epidemiology, prevention, and control of influenza viruses, both domestically and globally since 1998. And his work has encompassed clinical man management as well as other emerging respiratory viral infections. Lastly, I'd also like to welcome back Dr. Sherry Drenzik. Dr. Drenzik is the State Epidemiologist and Chief Science Officer for the Georgia Department of Public Health and has previously served in multiple infectious diseases and epidemiological capacities for the Georgia DPH. Additionally, Dr. Drenzik has served as an Assistant Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine and has led the Georgia Department of Health's epidemiologic response to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome to you all. To place this session in context, the Emory University Series Communicable Diseases Program in conjunction with the SRDRS puts together situation reports on special pathogens of concern for our region, HHS Region 4. These sit reps are typically published on our website, social media channels, Emory Department of Medicine YouTube channel, and listservs. So here's the current HHS Region 4 special pathogen sit rep. First, the most recent situation report from the Nigeria Center for Disease Control reported 676 confirmed cases of loss of fever with four probable and 109 deaths, equating to a case fatality rate of approximately 16%. This represents cases from 2023 alone and is higher than the same period from 2022. The In-Country Emergency Operations Center continues to coordinate all activities and the national transmission risk within Nigeria does remain high. In Equatorial Guinea, the current death toll from the Marburg virus outbreak first detected in January of this year following a funeral service stands at 11. There are unconfirmed reports of four new suspected cases as of this week, three of which have been admitted into a hospital, but it is not clear the connection to the original cluster. Contact tracing and disease surveillance continue. Next. As of last week, the country of Bangladesh identified three additional cases of Nipah virus and two additional deaths, an increase from 11 cases and eight deaths two weeks prior. Since the beginning of this year, the country has seen 14 confirmed cases, all connected to the consumption of raw date palm sap. Again, this is the most in the country since 2015, 
And while the risk remains high for additional cases in Bangladesh, the global risk continues to remain low as international travel is difficult from the affected region. And last, excuse me, and lastly, as we are going to delve into the current situation regarding influenza A H5N1, I will leave this to the panelists, except to say there have been no reports of other suspected or confirmed patients with special pathogens of concern in Region 4 at this time. For more resources, visit, visit us on the web at scdu.emory.edu. Okay, before we delve into the main topic at hand, I wanted to first pose some interactive poll questions to our audience to gauge our comfort level with this topic. You can see on your screen, the first question is, how confident do you feel about utilizing the process of identifying, isolating, and informing as it pertains to encountering a patient with a suspected case of highly pathogenic avian influenza on a scale of not at all confident to completely confident? And the second question, how knowledgeable do you feel about the clinical management of a person with a suspected or confirmed case of AH5N1 on a scale of not at all knowledgeable to very knowledgeable? If you could please vote now. All right, and if we can show the results of that up on the screen, please. So for the first question, we have quite a range from not at all confident to completely confident. And for the second question as well, we have quite a range. So our panelists have a lot of work to do, but we hope that we are able to provide you with this educational opportunity that you may take back with you to your home institutions. So with that, let me now turn it over to Dr. Piantadosi. Great, thank you so much, Gavin. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, excited to share with you not just one, but two cases. Um, I was invited to pre present one case and I uh, always like to over deliver. So um, I'll be sharing with you the case of both an 18 year old man with pneumonia and an 80 year, 80s year old person with no symptoms. Um, and I hope you'll see soon why these are both relevant and interesting to the topic at hand. So the first patient um, is an 18-year-old man with pneumonia. He presented with six days of cough, shortness of breath, fever, and diarrhea. He was a smoker, but otherwise previously healthy. And his labs and initial workup showed leukopenia and thrombocytopenia. Unfortunately, he required mechanical ventilation and vasopressors um, due to hypoxia. And you can see here the progression of his chest X-ray um, over 10 days of infection. And at least for me, it's hard to not think of this as COVID. Um, but as you'll note from kind of the, the reference, this was back in 2004 um, and so clearly wasn't. Um, the patient was found to have an influenza antigen test that was positive. Um, and then a little bit more information uh, that kind of puts this into the context of what we're talking about today um, is that the team noted that he had worked as a farmer and in particular had been handling live and dead chickens four days previously. Of note, I mentioned that this occurred in 2004, and this was actually in January 2004 in Vietnam, um, which was when there was in the, in the midst of a outbreak of H5N1 among poultry. Um, and there was a series of several patients who had been noted throughout the country shown here um, by these individual dots, uh, multiple patients who had been coming in with concerning respiratory um, illnesses. This patient's nasal and throat swabs were indeed positive for H5N1 influenza by RT-PCR, um, as were tests from all the, all the other patients shown on the map here. The patient was treated with oseltamivir and high-dose methylprednisolone um, and unfortunately died on day nine. Um, of note, no family members or other household contacts uh, or close contacts of this patient became sick. Um, and as really kind of nicely described by the publication that I've noted here, this patient was one of 10 cases of H5N1 influenza that were reported in Vietnam from December of 2003 to January of 2004 amidst what was at the time a large known outbreak in poultry that had been being monitored very closely. And I think when we think about H5N1 influenza, this is the kind of case that we think about and worry about, which is a young, healthy person um, who becomes incredibly sick and uh, ultimately passes away due to the disease. And I just wanna contrast that with another case. Um, this is an 80s year old person with no symptoms, um, again, from a publication that I've listed below. 
Um, and this is much more recent. So this occurred in December of 2021 um, in England when there was known to be a large H5N1 outbreak that was occurring among domestic poultry, commercial poultry, and even wild birds. Um, and so the map on the right there is not showing human cases like before, but this is showing cases in birds um, where the black triangles are um, domestic and commercial poultry and the red dots are wild birds. Um, so again, a situation where there was a lot of H5N1 being monitored um, there was some testing because there was an outbreak detected um, among a duck flock, um, and the owner was tested uh, for screening and surveillance pur purposes, even though he was asymptomatic, or he or she was asymptomatic. Um, and this person tested positive for influenza A, um, and then kind of the routine workup that was done is H1 and H3 typing PCRs, and both of those were negative. Um, so this raised concern that this could also be H5N1. Um, the person was instructed to isolate at home, and they were treated with oseltamivir for 10 days. Um, and then the H5 subtyping PCR was indeed positive. I'm showing you the CT value here in the mid-30s, which I think we're all a little bit more used to thinking about CT values now in the context of COVID. It's obviously not perfectly quantitative, um, but this is kind of a high number, um, indicating perhaps a low amount of virus in the sample. Um, they were able to sequence this virus, um, and that's shown here by the bold red um, on a phylogenetic tree. And you can see here uh, this branch of the tree, this sequence from the person, clusters very, very closely with a sequence from a duck in England obtained during the same time period. Um, and in fact, these sequences were essentially identical. The patient remained asymptomatic um, and ultimately had two negative PCR tests before they were um, released from uh, isolation. Um, and it was noted that there was a close contact of this patient who was um, tested for surveillance purposes and remained negative throughout this time. And so I think just kind of drawing together a couple of inferences and questions that came to my mind in thinking about these two cases, um, I think both of them show that influenza H5N1 is strongly associated with exposure to poultry. Um, and we know from these and other cases that there's really limited human to human transmission. What I thought was especially interesting is that we know that H5N1 is highly pathogenic to birds, and we think of it as highly pathogenic to humans, um, but the second case shows that asymptomatic infection does occur. Um, and so questions that come to my mind, both as a scientist and maybe for us to discuss um, as a group and panel, um, what accounts for the wide spectrum of illness that we see, and could we be missing mild or asymptomatic cases of H5N1? So with that, I'll conclude the clinical cases. Thank you very much, Dr. Piantadosi, for that excellent presentation. Again, I want to remind the audience as we're gearing up for our next presentation by Dr. Oyeki, that if they do have questions, then please type them in the Q&A feature um, as well. And so with that, Dr. Oyeki, I will turn it over to you. Um, great. Thanks so much. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So um, thanks, um, Dr. Piantadosi. I'm going to speak about human infections with highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1 virus. I have no disclosures to report. And what I'm going to talk about is give some background about H5N1 virology, the epidemiology of uh, human cases of H5N1 since 1997, um, uh, clinical presentation, clinical management, including diagnosis and antiviral treatment and further supportive care, um, and give an update on the current global situation. So as background, um, there are different types of influenza viruses, types A, B, C, and D. I'm go only gonna focus on influenza A viruses. And influenza A viruses are classified into subtypes based upon the two main surface glycoproteins, the hemagglutinin, or we refer to that as the HA, and the neuraminidase refer to that as the NA. These are the two most important antigens. Um, the hemagglutinin protein is where actually the influenza A viruses bind to receptors. Um, and the neuraminidase is involved in um, uh, disease severity. And also um, in, it catalyzes the release of infected um, variants, or sorry, some 
viral particles or virions from infected cells. So there's a category of drugs called the neuraminidase inhibitors that actually work to block the function of neuraminidase and therefore block the release of infected virions. Um, so there are 18 um, known hemagglutinin subtypes to date and eight, 11 neuraminidase subtypes to date. And you can see in the upper right um, corner, the different um, subtypes um, of uh, hemagglutinin as well as neuraminidase that have been found. All have been found in wild birds, really um, waterfowl, except for um, H17N10 and H18N9, which have been found in bats. But otherwise, um, the natural reservoir for nearly all influenza A virus subtypes is in wild birds, particularly um, aquatic waterfowl. So we classify avian influenza A viruses into two groups, either highly pathogenic or low pathogenic. And there are specific molecular and pathogenicity criteria. Um, it's not whether these viruses kill birds or they don't kill birds, although that tends to be the case, but just to know that there's actually specific criteria that must be met. Uh, molecular and pathogenicity criteria. So highly pathogenic or HPAI viruses are a threat to agricultural worldwide, particularly because they can cause rapid mortality and actually high mortality among domestic poultry. Um, they may or may not um, cause death in wild birds, um, but they definitely can. Um, there are many different animal species that can be infected with different kinds of influenza A viruses, and there are some animal hosts, uh, poultry, pigs, and other animals in which influenza viruses circulate. Um, people may not know that uh, marine mammals can be infected with influenza A viruses. There are uh, canine influenza A viruses that circulate among dogs. There are equine influenza A viruses that circulate among horses, but the the main animal species that we worry about for public health are uh, wild birds and poultry, and then pigs because of swine influenza A viruses. And sporadic avian to human or pig to human transmission can occur and has been reported. Uh, and really one important characteristic of influenza A viruses is that they can evolve through genetic reassortment or exchange of genes and antigenic drift. It's important to realize that seasonal influenza A viruses that infect people and circulate among humans worldwide and avian influenza A viruses that circulate among birds have different receptor binding tropism. So what you can see on the upper left figure is that in the human upper respiratory tract, we have mostly um, what's referred to is sialic acid receptors that are linked to galactose by alpha-2,6 linkages. And these are expressed on epithelial cells and influenza A viruses or seasonal viruses that circulate among people worldwide preferentially infect and bind to alpha-2,6 sialic acid receptors in the upper respiratory tract of people. In the lower respiratory tract of people, we have mostly a different kind of receptor. It's alpha-2,3 sialic acid receptors. Um, that is not to say that it's completely this upper and lower difference, but to say, because there are some alpha-2,3 receptors in the upper respiratory tract and some alpha-2,6 receptors in the lower respiratory tract. But for the most part, influenza A viruses that circulating among people, um, and including uh, when we have pandemic influenza viruses that emerge, uh, bind to the upper respiratory tract or these um, alpha-2,6 sialic acid receptors. In contrast, if you look at the bottom figure, avian influenza A viruses that are circulating among birds and poultry worldwide, they bind to um, alpha-2,3 sialic acid receptors. We refer to those as avian-like. Um, and these are found in the respiratory and gastrointestinal tracts of birds. And so when birds are infected, um, they excrete these viruses both in respiratory secretions, but importantly in feces. Um, 
and they may be viable for uh, depending upon temperature and humidity and other environmental conditions for prolonged periods. So a little background about highly pathogenic avian influenza AH5 and one virus. The first time this virus was identified was in 1959 during a poultry outbreak in Scotland. But most importantly, um, there was isolation of um, an H5N1 virus from a goose in southern China. We refer to this as the goose Guangdong uh, 1996 virus. Um, and all H5N1 viruses that have circulated since then among birds um, have in some degree evolved from um, this uh, goose Guangdong 1996 virus. And you can see in the upper right, although you probably can't read that at all, just to show the evolution since 1996 of H5N1 viruses. And what they've done is they've diversified and they've evolved into groups that we call different clades and then further subdivisions that we refer to as subclades. And what happened was during 2004 to 2007, and particularly um, there was spread in wild birds and poultry initially from Asia, then to other regions of the world, um, particularly Europe, Africa and the Middle East in more than 60 countries reported either wild bird outbreaks or poultry outbreaks during that period. And since then, there's been endemic circulation or referred to as enzootic spread among poultry in some countries. And those include countries in Asia and the Middle East. And in recent years, particularly starting in 2020, there's this particular group that we refer to as clade 2.3.4.4b viruses, and you may have heard about this a lot in the news, um, that these spread from migratory birds from Asia into other regions of the world, particularly in Africa and Europe. And then in late 2021 into 2022, there was spread to North America, and there was um, poultry outbreaks and wild bird detections. Um, and you can see the list of um, a partial list of many different wild birds, which include waterfowl as well as shorebirds, as well as predatory birds. And then in late 22 into this year, there's spread of H5N1 viruses um, into, through wild birds and to cause some poultry outbreaks in South America. So um, almost all regions of the world now have um, had poultry outbreaks or wild bird detections of H5N1 virus, um, and particularly with this clade 2.3.4.4b. And there's been transmission spillover to some mammals that have been reported, but this has been reported since 2003. Uh, in terrestrial mammals, this was um, in late 2003 into 2004, the reports of tigers and leopards in a zoo that had been fed um, uh, dead poultry, uh, also spread to dogs and cats that have uh, consume poultry that were sick or dead and other animals. And then more recently in the last few years, there's been a wide range of ma mammalian species that have been reported, foxes, raccoon, dogs. Um, you can see the list there and it goes on and on. And these are really sporadic detections. And there also have been infections uh, reported in marine mammals, seals, dolphin, and um, porpoise. And people are probably aware of reports um, of an outbreak in farm mink in Spain that was in October and November of last year. And just to say that none of this is really new. Um, there have been infections of avian influenza viruses in farm mink be farmed mink before. There have also been highly pathogenic um, as well as uh, low pathogenic avian influenza virus infections of seals in the past. Now, uh, the first human case of H5N1 was reported in May of uh, 1997 in Hong Kong. And in that outbreak, there were a total of 18 cases um, from May to December 1997, resulting in six deaths. And this really was the first time um, uh, an outbreak was reported and it caused um, a lot of panic and a lot of concern about the potential for an H5N1 pandemic, also with pretty high mortality, although relatively small number of cases. 
and Hong Kong was able to control that outbreak by uh, culling millions of poultry, closing down live poultry markets in Hong Kong, stopping importation of poultry from Southern China into Hong Kong and cleaning up the markets, making other changes. And they were able to stop that outbreak. We didn't hear much about human cases of H5N1 until early in 2003, in which there were some um, cases reported in a family from Hong Kong that had gone to Southern China and then returned. Um, and then we had emergence of um, cases in Southeast Asia and um, Vietnam and Thailand and spread to other countries. And then cases in other countries have been reported in other regions, including the Middle East, Europe and Africa, uh, particularly with the spread, as I mentioned, um, to many different countries in wild birds and um, causing poultry outbreaks. So from um, 1997 to 2003, there are 20 cases that were reported. And then since, uh, since 2003, there have been approximately 873 cases with more than 50% case fatality proportion um, reported from 21 countries. However, there have been very few um, cases reported worldwide since 2016. These cases have really reflected sporadic avian to human transmission due to poultry exposures, mostly to sick or dead poultry. Um, there's been um, uh, some small number of cases with an unknown source of infection. Just to note that there was one travel associated case um, in North America that was reported in an uh, report, uh, individual from Canada who had traveled to China for three weeks and then returned and upon actually had illness onset on the plane um, and then re returned was admitted with um, meningoencephalitis and pneumonia and that was a fatal case. Um, there have been some clusters of epidemiologically linked cases in time, um, both the location and in time and most of these clusters have represented common poultry exposures in family members. However, there has been a small number of clusters reported, um, um, I believe from about five countries in which there was probable limited non-sustained human to human transmission among blood related family members. Um, and that includes both second generation, so avian to human to human, as well as third generation, avian to human to human to human transmission and that was dead end transmission, so no further transmission. So the main risk factors for H5N1 virus infection are direct or close exposure to sick or dead infected poultry um, or visiting a live poultry market. And then in terms of the limited non-sustained human to human transmission, the risk factor is prolonged, unprotected, close exposure to a symptomatic H5N1 case patient. And this has occurred both in households or uh, through, household, through hospital exposures, through caring for a case. This is the epidemic curve of human cases of H5N1 um, by illness onset date and by country since 1997. And you can see that there, um, particularly in the middle, um, of this graph, there is sort of a, a periodicity. And these, this reflects sort of um, the seasonality of these human cases that typically have occurred during the cooler temperature months. And that's when these poultry outbreaks occur uh, more commonly during, the during uh, cooler temperature months, but it's not exclusively only during cooler temperature months. And then in the right, you can see um, really since 2016, we've had very, very few human cases worldwide, including more recently. So the clinical spectrum of H5N1 virus infection is very wide. As Dr. Um, Piantadosi has pointed out, uh, a case of, she presented a case of asymptomatic infection. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, there's clearly been presentations to pneumonia and fulminant critical illness. Um, most case finding is focused on hospitalized patients with severe pneumonia. So actually, we're really looking for the sickest. Um, but when you do surveillance of uh, close monitoring of, of close contacts of cases, or through routine surveillance for influenza-like illness, this has uh, picked up a small number of um, mild illness cases of H5N1 virus infection. And uh, I would say there have been uh, more um, mild illness cases 
really just upper respiratory tract symptoms um, reported in children than in adults. Now, the issue of asymptomatic um, H5N1 virus infection, I'll just say that some reported cases of asymptomatic uh, infection uh, probably do not represent true infection. They probably represent transient detection of H5N1 viral particles that are deposited into the upper respiratory tract. But just to say that there have been asymptomatic cases with uh, virologic detection. So they tested positive by sampling the upper respiratory tract by RT-PCR. Um, but there's at least two cases that also had serologic confirmation um, of, of infection. So they seroconverted between acute and convalescent uh, sera. So that to me is pretty solid evidence that asymptomatic H5N1 virus infection can occur. But it's, we know from sero surveys that this is probably pretty uncommon. So although the case finding is biased because most cases are identified at hospital admission with pneumonia, particularly severe pneumonia, I'm not sure um, how much lower the case fatality really is. It's probably lower than reported case fatality because it doesn't include the whole denominator of asymptomatic or mild illness, but it's probably not dramatically lower. There are many different complications of H5N1 virus infection that have been reported. Clearly, pneumonia is the most common complication with progression to respiratory failure, ARDS, in some cases. Um, typically, those would be fatal cases, but not always. Um, I'll just say that um, community-acquired bacterial co-infection is quite rare. That is, um, uh, in contrast to seasonal influenza, where we know that community-acquired secondary bacterial co-infection is much more common. Um, however, once the patient is ventilated, clearly ventilator-associated pneumonia can develop um, uh, with uh, both um, um, uh, antibiotic-resistant gram-negative bacteria as well as fungal pathogens if the patient is certainly in the intensive care unit for prolonged periods. Um, other complications that were reported are acute kidney injury, cardiac failure, sepsis, shock, DIC, and multi-organ failure, most typically respiratory and renal failure. But there have been some atypical complications, including encephalitis with diarrhea and pneumonia. Uh, initially, when the patient is presented with seizures, um, you know, H5N1 was not suspected. Um, Encephalitis with obstructive hydrocephalus has been, has been reported in a uh, pediatric patient, and meningoencephalitis with pneumonia and a fatal outcome is reported in an adult. Rye syndrome with salicylate exposure has been reported way back to uh, um, the 1997 Hong Kong outbreak in a child, in fact, the first case. Spontaneous miscarriage in a pregnant woman, as well as vertical transmission uh, mother to fetus has been uh, demonstrated through an autopsy study. The pathogenesis of H5N1 virus infection, so the incubation period is a median of three days after poultry exposures. Most um, symptomatic uh, illness occurs within seven days of poultry exposure and infection. Patients with severe disease, really um, the pathogenesis is um, infection of the respiratory tract, particularly preferential infection of the lower respiratory tract resulting in high viral levels, which triggers a dysregulated host inflammatory response. High levels of um, H5N1 virus in the upper respiratory tract has been reported to be associated with fatal outcomes. Uh, we know that um, in some studies, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines are induced and clearly can cause uh, diffuse alveolar damage and multi-organ injury. Um, there has been extrapulmonary viral dissemination that has um, reported uh, through viremia. So H5N1 viral RNA has been detected in blood serum and plasma, and virus has actually been isolated from blood in a few patients. Uh, we know that viral antigens or nucleic acid has been detected in cerebral neurons, lymph nodes, placenta and placental neutrophils, fetal macrophages, small and large intestinal tissues, and bone marrow. Um, and virus has been isolated from both respiratory, upper and lower respiratory tract specimens, blood serum, plasma, rectal swabs and feces, as well as CSF. Um, also to mention in a few cases, there's been reactive hemophagocytosis with lymphoid depletion reported. 
So um, CDC infection prevention control recommendations, um, the rationale is because there is potential for both close range large droplet and small particle aerosol spread, um, and because H5N1 virus infection in reported cases is associated with high mortality, <clears throat> the patient who is suspected or confirmed with H5N1 should be placed in an airborne infection isolation room. If such a room is not available, then the patient should be isolated in, single, in a single patient room. A face mask should be placed on the patient, keep the door closed, and arrange transfer to a facility with um, an airborne infection isolation room that would uh, have negative pressure and HEPA filtration. Uh, we do recommend standard contact and airborne precautions. Um, personal protective equipment recommended would be single use gown, gloves, and eye protection, uh, particularly with goggles, um, and a fit tested N95 respirator or higher level of respiratory protection. Uh, patients typically present with severe disease um, they don't typically present earlier. Um, the median time from illness onset to admission in most patients is approximately six days. In terms of their clinical progression, they typically, um, those that have severe disease typically um, have onset of fever or feverishness, non-productive cough, malaise, headache, sore throat, uh, myalgia, abdominal pain, and uh, definitely uh, vomiting and diarrhea can occur and it's more frequent than with seasonal influenza. And um, over uh, several days, um, really around days uh, probably four, five, and six, there's progression to lower respiratory tract disease. So the patient will um, manifest dyspnea, shortness of breath, uh, may have chest pain and tachypnea. And at admission, typically patients have uh, hypoxia, signs of pneumonia, Laboratory findings include leukopenia, lymphopenia, mild to moderate thrombocytopenia, and there's a real wide range of uh, radiographic findings, including patchy interstitial infiltrates, lobar consolidation. Um, there may be diffuse infiltrates. Um, there may be uh, pleural effusions. So here's examples of um, two cases. Um, I took these photos of chest x-rays. These are patients from Indonesia. And the top is a 37-year-old um, woman who presented on day seven of illness. You can see her admission checks, chest X-ray, and four days or three days later, um, the progression to um, really severe bilateral disease, and she died the next day. But I want to contrast that in, with the bottom cases: a 21-year-old male, um, illness day number five. Um, his chest x-ray, not that impressive, but one week later, you can see um, diffuse bilateral disease. Uh, incredibly to me, uh, I actually examined this patient um, and this patient was hypoxic. He was on um, uh, supplemental oxygen. They did not have the ability to ventilate him or give um, non-invasive or um, uh, high, high flow oxygen. Um, and he was tachypnic into the 60s. Um, much to my shock, he um, survived. So that's a really happy story. Um, so diagnostic testing. So patients who have mild disease, you should collect a, um, multiple upper respiratory tract specimens, an NP swab, and we do recommend a combined nasal and throat swab. Um, put in this, you know, collect those swabs, put them in the same specimen. And so separately test the NP swab and the combined nasal and throat swabs by real-time RT-PCR for influenza A and B viruses at public health laboratories in the U.S. Uh, all state public health laboratories have the CDC uh, real-time um, uh, influenza diagnostic panel. And so you'll get an influenza A positive, and then you can use the CDC subtyping panel in a public health lab to subtype for H1 and H3. Um, if A is positive, H1 and H3 are negative, then test for H5 by the CDC um, H5 primer probe set. If H5 is positive, then those specimens need to be sent to CDC for confirmation. Um, just to say that there are many commercially available influenza tests. Um, 
in clinical settings, uh, most of them just uh, type influenza A versus influenza B. So you'll get an influenza A positive, but you will not be able to distinguish whether or not um, that is a seasonal influenza A virus or even a novel influenza A virus, um, another kind such as a swine virus um, or another avian virus. And so um, you really need to have the specimen sent to a public health laboratory for um, testing by the CDC uh, influenza panels, as mentioned. Uh, just to say that throat swabs have a higher sensitivity to de detect H5N1 viruses um, than uh, higher upper respiratory tract specimens. This is actually the opposite of seasonal influenza. So the optimal uh, specimens to detect seasonal influenza in the upper respiratory tr tract is a nasal pharyngeal specimen and throat swabs have the lowest sensitivity, lowest yield. So for H5N1, it's the reverse because H5N1 viruses um, actually are more likely to infect the lower respiratory tract. So in patients with lower respiratory tract disease um, who are suspected of have H5N1 collect upper respiratory tract specimens as well as sputum for the same testing. The patient is intubated then also collect upper respiratory tract specimens, but collect an endotracheal aspirate. And then if um, um, uh, BAL is performed, then also send uh, BAL fluid. But um, if possible, probably, um, because it's less invasive, just send an endotracheal aspirate. Um, so clinical management. So the key is really initiating an antiviral treatment as soon as possible. And so for patients with mild disease, we would recommend uh, neuraminidase inhibitor treatment. And typically it's oseltamivir as soon as possible. Standard uh, dosing twice daily for five days. Um, we have no clinical trials of antivirals for H5N1 virus infection, but we do have observational studies. They are limited, and there are a limited number of patients, but in general, they typically report that earlier initiation of treatment in the clinical course is associated with greater survival versus later treatment initiation. In patients with lower respiratory tract disease, um, similarly, just start oseltamivir treatment as soon as possible. Um, even if you do not have confirm lab confirmation of H5N1 virus infection, you can start it empirically uh, based upon suspicion of H5, based upon uh, clinical presentation and history of exposures. So we don't know the optimal dosing and duration for oseltamivir treatment of patients with severe H5N1 disease. Um, but it seems quite reasonable to extend duration beyond the five days, particularly if the patient has severe disease and they're hospitalized because of the potential for prolonged viral shedding. There's no need to double the dose of oseltamivir um, and patients who are intubated, you can certainly give it uh, enterically through um, a, naso gast a naso or oral gastric tube and it'll be well absorbed. Um, just to also say there are um, um, a few case reports of emergence of oseltamivir or other neuraminidase inhibitor resistance during treatment. Um, so it's something to think about. The biggest gap we have is we have no data on combination antiviral treatment of H5N1 patients using um, antivirals with different mechanisms of action. Um, the hallmark really of clinical management in addition to antiviral treatment is just supportive care of complications. And so it's respiratory support, advanced organ support, which might include not only respiratory support, but uh, renal replacement therapy for um, <laughs> acute kidney failure. Um, adjunctive therapy, we only have some observational data, but in general, what I would say is avoid high dose corticosteroids. And the reason is um, not only will it immunosuppress the patient, but it's associated with prolonged H5N1 viral shedding. It may increase the risk for ventilator-associated pneumonia, and the patient might actually die of um, resistant um, um, antibiotic-resistant bacterial infection or fungal infection. Um, there are observational studies to suggest that moderate to high-dose corticosteroids may increase the risk of mortality. And so, definitely avoid high-dose corticosteroids um, for high-dose. 
the issue of low dose, there may be some value there, low to moderate dose possibly, but definitely avoid high dose corticosteroids. We don't have data for other immunomodulator therapy um, as we do for say COVID-19 patients. It's definitely something that is um, an area of, of uh, that's a big gap. And I'll just mention that there are case reports of antiviral treatment and convalescent plasma that was administered to, administered to two critically ill H5N1 patients and both survived, but it's very hard to interpret um, those cases without a comparator. So the current situation is that there is this clade 2.3.4.4B of H5N1 viruses that are circulating in wild birds and poultry poultry in most regions of the world with sporadic spillover to mammals. In the US, um, H5N1 viruses have been detected in wild birds in 49 states and in commercial or backyard poultry in 47 states. Since January 2022, there are more than 58 million poultry that have been culled. Um, and since January 2022, there have been 10 human cases reported, all have had recent poultry exposure. Um, and I'm just gonna go through these really quickly. Most of them have been due to clade 2.3.4.4B, except for the two most recent cases from Cambodia. So the first case is the case that Dr. Uh, Piantadosi uh, presented, was an elderly asymptomatic uh, man who raised ducks. And that one is a little more convincing because he was positive on three different days in which he was sampled in the upper respiratory tract. Uh, I think there's still a possibility that could represent um, contamin environmental contamination, but I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat persuaded because he was positive uh, in respiratory specimens collected on three different days. Um, the US case that was reported in Colorado in April of last year was an adult involved in poultry culling. He reported only fatigue, no other sem symptoms. Um, I am very uh, dubious that this person actually had um, uh, H5N1 virus infection. I think this is probably environmental contamination. Um, he had a very low level of H5N1 virus detected in one uh, upper respiratory tract specimen. Um, there have been some severe cases. Uh, a child in Vietnam last year developed critical illness and survived. Um, um, an adult in China last fall developed critical illness and died. And then uh, Spain reported last fall two asymptomatic adult poultry workers. Um, that was, uh, they were workers who were swabbed um, at a farm that had a confirmed H5N1 poultry outbreak. Um, I'll just say that um, uh, this year, um, particularly last month, there was a report in Euro surveillance by Spanish um, uh, public health uh, colleagues that attributed that those two cases to environmental contamination and not actually H5N1 virus infection. Also very high, sorry, high CT values, but low levels of virus detected in single um, specimens uh, from the upper respiratory tract in two individuals. Um, a case reported this year that occurred at the end of um, December, so, sorry, um, yeah, um, a child that developed critical illness, that should be December, 2022, um, who survived, um, this was H5N1, uh, more recently, uh, a, a, an adult with severe illness reported from China. Um, all, all, the only information that's reported is the uh, adult was hospitalized with severe illness. We don't know the outcome yet. Um, and then last month, um, actually about three weeks ago, um, two cases confirmed in Cambodia. Uh, the first case was a child who died and her father uh, had mild illness in follow-up. It turns out they both had similar date of illness onset. They both had exposure to uh, sick and dead poultry, uh, backyard poultry that were raised. Um, There's no evidence of human to human transmission. And the father just had mild influenza-like illness. So all 10 of these cases 
had recent poultry exposure. Um, I think that only seven actually had true infection, um, plus the asymptomatic, that includes the asymptomatic case from um, the UK. So in summary, what I would say is that these clade 2.3.4.4b viruses are circulating in wild birds and poultry in most regions of the world with sporadic spillover to mammals. There are other clades of H5N1 virus in circulation in some countries, and the two Cambodia cases were infected with clade 2.3.2.1c viruses, which have been um, enzootic in Cambodia for many years uh, since 2014. So it's pretty clear that these viruses are well adapted to infect and spread among wild birds and poultry. Um, there's been sporadic spillover to mammals. That is not surprising, um, but there's no evidence of sustained transmission of H5N1 viruses among mammals. And there's never been an instance of mammal to human transmission reported. All sporadic human cases reported since 2022 have had exposure to poultry, no indication of human to human transmission. I think we should expect additional sporadic human infections with H5N1 viruses um, um, resulting from um, exposure to sick or dead poultry. Um, and right now, uh, there's no evidence that H5N1 viruses that have uh, infected wild birds, poultry, or mammals have the ability to bind well to receptors in the human upper respiratory tract. And so they actually lack ability to spread efficiently among people. So overall, at CDC, we view the public health risk to be low, but clearly vigilance and ongoing monitoring is needed. And I'll just close by saying that there are Although there's a lot of focus on H5N1 virus, there are different, um, there's actually quite a few different highly pathogenic as well as low pathogenic avian influenza A viruses that have infected people to cause a wide spectrum of disease. And just to say that pathogenicity in infected poultry does not necessarily translate to, pathogenic, to pathogenicity in infected people. And you can just see that in terms of uncomplicated disease, particularly upper respiratory tract disease, many different low pathogenic as well as highly pathogenic avian influenza virus subtypes have been reported. And then also many different subtypes, both low pathogenic and highly pathogenic have caused a range of um, lower respiratory tract disease. And with that, I'll just uh, close by leaving a slide up on um, references both to CDC guidance as well as um, some other publications. And I'll stop there um, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Drenzek. Thank you very much, Dr. Yucky. And just to remind the audience, we will be providing slides to this session when the recording is posted next week to everyone. So you will have access to those references and resources. All right, Dr. Drenzek, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, we've had the, the great opportunity to hear um, about the epidemiology of, uh, of avian influenza and its clinical management. I just wanted to take just a few minutes and talk a little bit about uh, the public health perspective. And um, hold on a second, I'm so sorry. All right, so sorry about that. Uh, so when we think about um, avian influenza, um, in particular H5N1, um, uh, as we've been discussing, I wanted to talk just a little bit about uh, the state health department impact and role. So normally, you know, when we're thinking about um, highly pathogenic avian influenza, in particular the H5N1 situation that has been um, going on in North America uh, since 2022, um, as uh, Dr. Uyaki had mentioned to us, normally when we think about um, HPAI spreading to commercial poultry flocks from wild birds, 
the impact primarily is economic um, in regards to the you know, commercial poultry or backyard poultry. But for us in public health, when we think about this, and especially in the big picture, our concern is that really any animal um, flu virus that develops the ability to infect people can evolve and change and potentially cause a pandemic. So even though we are really not seeing um, evidence of sustained human to human transmission with influenza A, um, H5N1, you know, throughout most of our experience with it, uh, there are, it could change. And there are other, uh, um, again, um, avian influenza viruses that may uh, potentially have the ability to, to um, uh, mingle together uh, with these viruses and theoretically cause a pandemic. So it, even though it's conservative, we're very, very cautious and really want to venture this. And what does this mean practically? So for us at a state health department, ultimately this practically translates into our mantra of identify, isolate, and inform. But for us at a state health department, what we want to do is really have the ability to detect possible um, H5N1 um, infections uh, in persons that were exposed to infected birds. And that may be here, uh, you know, in our own state, in the US, it may involve travelers uh, from other parts of the world. So we need to have the ability to be able to detect this uh, and have mechanisms for traveler surveillance. Um, and we also uh, have the ability to detect these potential infections in responders or workers uh, in commercial poultry or um, uh, again, uh, on farms as well. So for us uh, in Georgia, the Georgia Department of Public Health, we really need these, these key areas. We need to have traveler surveillance. Uh, we have, uh, again, uh, the ability to um, work very closely with our CDC uh, global migration and quarantine partners in um, being able to uh, respond to potential travelers of significance. Uh, we have the state laboratory infrastructure to test for H5 or other uh, novel flu viruses. And we also have the infrastructure to monitor um, again, uh, any workers or responders for influenza-like illness post-exposure to poultry and then test them at our, at our state public health laboratory as appropriate. So for us in Georgia, um, and again, by the way, uh, Georgia is the top poultry producing um, state in the nation, and um, the poultry business is our number one multi, multi-billion dollar agribusiness in Georgia, so it's really important. We've had a lot of opportunity to plan uh, for highly pathogenic avian influenza in Georgia with a number of partners, including uh, not only public health partners, but agriculture partners, our United States, both at the Georgia level and USDA as well, um, industry here in Georgia, and also our universities. So ultimately for us in Georgia, although um, our, um, our other partners such as agriculture primarily are going to be involved in sort of on-farm surveillance, testing of flocks, and then um, should we actually encounter HPAI um, in a flock, uh, ultimately depopulation or culling uh, of these flocks. But for us in public health, our primary role is really to monitor individuals potentially exposed to these affected birds. Um, and we have developed a system uh, that we can monitor these individuals electronically um, and then provide testing as needed. So let's just take a quick look, um, and this is my last slide, just at um, um, some instances that we've encountered uh, this ability in Georgia um, and used this ability uh, in 2022. So in Georgia um, last year, we actually documented two HPAI outbreaks among backyard poultry flocks not large, large, large commercial poultry kind of industry, but pretty large operations for backyard flocks as well, uh, a number of birds involved. We actually monitored 117 people that were involved with these birds, whether they be workers um, or responders um, from our agriculture um, partners as well, responders for culling uh, or depopulation, as I mentioned before. So 117 people, we monitor them for 10 days. We set them up in an electronic system, just like we did for kind of Ebola monitoring or other, or, or, um, uh, other uh, types of um, you know, kind of travel associated infections as well. We have an electronic system. We enroll them 
Uh, they report um, every day um, their temperature, whether they have any symptoms. If they do have symptoms, we contact them, talk to them. Um, and if you break down the types of, of uh, people that we monitored, um, you know, we had 44 that were from our state agriculture department, 37 were workers on the, uh, the two farms, and 32 were um, contract responders, either from USDA or, or, uh, or other, who were sent to other states uh, for depopulation of flocks, but live in Georgia, so returned back to Georgia during their monitoring period. We really um, only um, uh, had two individuals that um, developed mild respiratory symptoms um, during all of this time. We actually arranged telemedicine consults for them to begin with, just to, to kind of go over their risk, to go over their symptoms. And we ultimately decided to test at our at our Georgia Public Health Laboratory um, these two individuals, although they had very low risk of exposure. They really were not directly involved with um, the birds themselves, but they worked on the farm. So they really didn't have high risk exposures. We did test them and both of them tested positive for rhinovirus. So it was uh, comforting that, again, we have the ability to monitor, um, you know, identify these infections so that we can keep individuals isolated um, again, we, just in case, you know, we just don't want that possibility of them uh, being able to transmit this virus into people where it can evolve and change and, and potentially spread. Uh, whereas, again, we might be able to see these differences. So I'll just stop there in the interest of time. Uh, thank you so much. I hope we have a chance for uh, some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Drenzik. We are a little bit over time, but I think it'd be prudent to perhaps answer some of the questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to direct just a few of them to Dr. Uyeki at the moment. One of the questions um, that has come up is, given the concern for mammalian transmission, especially among minks in Europe, does that mean anything in terms of greater risk for transmission to humans? So perhaps Dr. Uyeki, you could touch on that briefly. Yeah, great question. So whenever, um mammals are infected and particularly outbreaks. Um, so the farm mink outbreak in Spain in, in the fall of last year. Um, also, um, you may have heard about outbreaks among seals um, in off the coast of Peru uh, recently. And then there's a report that came out, I think yesterday in emerging infectious diseases about an outbreak off the US coast, um, which occurred last year. Um, among seals. So whenever these occur, it's really important to um, characterize the viruses. And so one is sequencing of the viruses. Another is clearly you isolate the viruses and you do studies on them to characterize them um, more, particularly um, looking at the transmission and pathogenesis in the ferret model. Um, so when you look at these viruses, at least the sequence of these viruses, um, there's no indication that they have the ability to bind to the alpha-2,6 receptors in the human upper respiratory tract. And so um, we think that um, to date, there's been no evidence um, either in H5N1 viruses circulating in birds, uh, poultry, or um, spillover to mammals, even in these outbreaks amongst farm mink or other mammals that suggests the ability to, to really um, increase transmission to people. There have been, um, in some of these mammalian outbreaks, uh, some mutations that might suggest um, uh, um, some adaptations to, to um, spread uh, maybe better in mammals and particularly um, to have higher viral levels. Um, but those appear, those mutations appear to have occurred in the infected mammals, and in other words, were not present de novo in viruses circulating in birds. So it's something that we still have to keep a, an eye on these um, viruses. But to date, there's the real concern is do, do the viruses have the ability to bind to the human upper respiratory tract? And there's been no indication of that to date. Thank you so much for that answer. Unfortunately, given the interest of time, I think we're going to have to stop there. We do have some more housekeeping things to complete. I will let the audience know that we will be addressing the questions that we did not get to when this session is made available as a recording next week. So please stay tuned for that.
Just really quickly, um, I want to thank our panelists, of course, for their fantastic presentations. I also do want to address one remaining poll question before we do close this session. For those that are still in attendance, if we could please put that up on the screen. Now, after having gone through this session, how knowledgeable at this point do you feel about the current state of influenza A, H5N1, and the management of a suspected or confirmed human case on a scale of not at all knowledgeable to extremely knowledgeable? If you could please vote now. All right, and if we could put the results up on the screen, please. It looks like our panelists have made significant inroads, which is fantastic. We have um, our participants are at least slightly knowledgeable about influenza A, H5N1. So that is fantastic news. Again, I wanna thank all of our panelists and the audience for participating today. We will have a uh, further uh, sessions to be that are forthcoming. You can fill out the details, uh, find the details on our website after filling out the survey. Please join us again soon and thank you very much.